although the medicines are extremely effective, uh, one phrase I like, I don't know who said it first, but it's the phrase that, you know, pills don't provide skills. What pills do is- Oh, that's provide, a good one. Yeah, well, they provide the ability of the brain to self-regulate, but they, they're not going to make up for all the skills a person has, has missed. And so it could be a child who's, maybe they're treated at the age of seven, but they've had ADHD since four. So for half their life, they haven't really been learning the right skills, or an adult may have not been treated for most of their life. So typically, life skills need to be taught in some setting. For the older, for the adolescent, older adults, it's cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, for kids, it's usually family behavior therapy is the um, is the method that's used, and that's a method where the parent learns methods that they can use to help their child learn to be uh, better socialized. Welcome to the Clear Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Tom Rountree, and this is where we discuss the intersection of life and medicine. Right. Welcome, Dr. Farone, to the Clear Health Podcast. I really appreciate you taking out the, your time to actually speak with me. Um, from everything that I read about you, I assume that you're really busy um, with all of your contributions uh, to the clinical world. Um, so I just kind of wanted to start off uh, talking about how you actually got into studying ADHD because you have a long, very long history of it. And sometimes people don't always stick to it. They don't always stick to the original thing that they, you know, wanted to study. It's very true. It's very true. So for me, uh, it happened... In the early 1980s, I was, uh, no, actually mid-1980s, I should say, I was a postdoc in a program in psychiatric epidemiology and genetics at Harvard Medical School. And at the time, at that time, I was working, uh, my mentor was a, a man who was studying schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And we were doing genetic studies, epidemiologic studies of those disorders. Um, and then one day we got a request from a colleague uh, the Mass General, who was studying ADHD, to help him out with the genetic epidemiology of a project that he wanted to get funded from the National Institutes of Health. So I took a look at his papers and what he proposed. It was it was intriguing, really interesting, and um, I started to delve a little bit more into ADHD than I had in the past, and just became very intrigued with the, with the disorder. And the fact that relatively little was known about it compared to other psychiatric problems, particularly in adults. In general, kind of child psychiatry has a lag behind adult psychiatry in terms of the research uh, effort that's been devoted to it. And back in the 80s, there was relatively little known about it. There were a lot of misconceptions about ADHD. Some people still thought it was caused by parents and you know, not knowing how to parent their kids and things of that mm -hmm. sort. Um, so I uh, basically changed my... I didn't change so much the, my methodological approach. I did a lot, still continue to do a lot of work in uh, psychiatric genetics and in clinical epidemiology, but I turned my focus to uh, primarily ADHD, although I did continue to work in other areas as well, but ADHD has really been my primary focus for about 30 years now. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Um, so I know you had, you, you mentioned that the focus kind of started more, you know, onto children and then you said something about how it wasn't caused or isn't caused by the parents. And I think that's something really important that I find in my clinical practice that the parents are almost kind of looking for either that, oh yeah, you did cause it or, you know, there's, you didn't cause it because it's kind of this kind of uh, yeah. guilt yeah. around their child having a problem. Can you, can you kind of explain a little bit more about that? Absolutely. But if you think about it, you know, there's a lot of information out there that tells parents how to be a good parent. There are books about it. There are podcasts about it. There are TV shows about it. And <laughs> yeah. parents, especially, I mean, I was a young parent once. And, you know, you when you start out as a young parent, you know, you've never done it before. So it's a totally new job that you weren't particularly well trained for. Um, and yeah, if you have a child that has problems, it's natural to think, did I do something wrong with this child? Um, and it's sometimes very frustrating to parents who maybe have three kids and one child's not doing well. They still tend to think, how did I treat that? You know, I mean, you, I can remember parents saying that. Well, how did I treat Johnny differently than Jane? Why, what, what was different? I can't, I can't put my finger on it. 
because there's a natural thought that it's, it's natural for people to think that parents have a huge impact on the development of their child. And yes, parents are important, but there are other factors that determine the child's course in life besides the parental input. Right, right. Yeah. And, and there is a large, I know, genetic component to ADHD, um, you know, across multiple genes and multiple loci. Um, and it's, it's kind of difficult to explain genetics to a parent. Um, and as far as, you know, how it contributes to ADHD and also other the, you know, the other comorbid um, mm -hmm. psychiatric problems that may come along with it. Um, so how would you, how would you kind of ex explain that to a parent? You know, if, if they're, if they're looking for an alternative answer, what would you, what would you kind of tell them? Well, what I tell them are, are the facts essentially what's, what the evidence is that's been collected over decades. And I explain to them that this is not something you know, that I did just one study and made a majority conclusion or my opinion that there are literally hundreds of studies of the genetics of ADHD. And when you put those all together, as I did in a recent review paper, uh, you come up with the conclusion that roughly 75 to 80% of ADHD is due to genetics. The rest mm -hmm. is due to effects of the, obviously the, the environment. And what that means mm -hmm. is that because most of it is due to genetics, that the role that the parent actually could play is, is by definition small to begin with, because there's not a lot of room for parental effects on the child's uh, the child disorder. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a that's a really good point. That there is, you know, there's the effects of the environment, which can play some small part, but you know, it is a more small part than it is a large part. Ex exactly. Um, exactly. And one of the things that's been interesting to me is the effect of um, stress on the development of these um, these traits in ADHD. In other words, of course, the more stress you know they have, mm -hmm. it seems like that they can uh, manifest these traits you know a lot more, um, which yeah. is which is interesting because sometimes you know, more stress can cancel out other, you know, other thoughts in the brain or other, you know, actions arising. Um, but it seems like stress kind of amplifies, um, you know, these, these traits for ADHD. Yeah. There's, so there's two ways to think about the effects of stress. Um, let's talk first about stress as a, uh, think about it as an uh, initial cause, like genes are an initial cause. Genes come before everything else. So we know they're an initial cause of the disorder. Um, we do know that extreme uh, emotional and nutritional deprivation very early in life can can lead to syndromes that are uh, essentially ADHD, lead to a diagnosis mm -hmm. of ADHD. Uh, these are, of course, rare events. We're talking about very extreme conditions. Uh, the classic work was done um, in some uh, studies by British researchers using uh, uh, studying kids that were raised in orphanages in Romania, where literally they were left in cribs with almost no food, no human contact. It was awful, awful, awful conditions. Oh, wow. These kids had very high rates of ADHD and other neurodevelopmental problems. So there's that kind of extreme stress is a cause of ADHD. Now, at the, that, that's, a, that's the only stress that we can really say it, it, it seems to be a cause of the disorder. On the other hand, mm -hmm. there's stress that occurs after the child has the disorder. Um, stress is something that fluctuates in one's life. We all experience that. And what um, one way, one conceptualization of ADHD, which I'd like to share with people, is to think about um, ADHD as a, a disorder which is primary feature is the inability to self-regulate a person's behavior, uh, their attention, and their ability to respond to impulses. Now that, and also a difficulty in regulating their emotions. Most of us can self-regulate. We might think we want to do something or say something. Let's say we're in a conversation and we get upset with somebody, but we'll talk ourselves down. We won't do it. We'll self-regulate our emotions. We'll calm down. Mm -hmm. We'll talk to ourselves. Um, a child with ADHD is more likely to get into a fight because they impulsively, they act without thinking. They're not self-regulating. Now, in our daily lives, we are in different environments that have 
different um, requirements of self-regulation. So if I'm sitting at home watching television, there's no requirement really for self-regulation. It's a very s simple, low stress environment. Uh, if I'm sitting here doing a podcast with you, I need to self-regulate. I can't just get up and go through a refrigerator and get a, <laughs> get a drink, right. or get some potato yeah. chips because I'm talking to you and you're expecting me to <laughs> right. give you answers, not to be walking mm -hmm. off and so forth. Um, as those demands for self-regulation increase, environments get more stressful and difficult for people with ADHD and those environments will tend to elicit more symptoms of the disorder. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, my, my three-year-old will just walk off in the middle and, you know, I don't think he has ADHD and, you know, yet. Um, but there is something to say that there is a, you know, regulatory kind of, I, I guess, act you would say, like when I'm in my clinic and I'm, talking with my patients, uh, he, they can kind of drift off sometimes, or a lot of mm -hmm. times they'll pull out their phone. Yep. Um, and I've often thought about, Hey, should I, should I, you know, ask them to put it away? Or, um, is there a way I can be more entertaining to them and, you know, actually really engaging them and getting them to listen, uh, can be a, a really difficult thing. It becomes a teachable moment in a way because they're, they're, you're absolutely observing an inability to self-regulate that the person's experiencing. Here they're, they're seeing you, they're seeing a doctor who's going to help them and then they're get, being distracted by something else. And so they're not actually benefiting from you the way they might benefit from you because of their, uh, their, 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 because of their lack of self-regulation. I, I want to get back to something you said because the sure. listeners might be like this to know about this. You mentioned that, yeah, my three-year-old will just walk off, you know, in the middle of a conversation or so forth. And some people will say, well, yeah, that's just normal kid behavior. You know, why is something like that ADHD? And mm -hmm. you, the point you were making was that it's normal for a three-year-old. It's not normal for a 12-year-old and or it's not right. normal for a 25-year-old. And so what, what people tend not to understand is that when an expert is making the diagnosis, they're looking at the person's behavior with respect to what's expected for their age level. What do we expect from a 10 year old, a 12 year old, a 25 year old, a 50 year old? Uh, we don't expect if a 50 year old is acting like a three year old, that could be a problem. <laughs> it usually is a problem. Yes. Yeah. If a three year old yeah. is acting like a three year old, that's fine. And they can be running around, climbing on furniture, um, doing all sorts of, of behaviors that would, we would, might think diagnose ADHD in a 10 year old, but not in a three year old. That's it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. The it very, very age dependent. Um, and, and that kind of brings me to the criteria for, you know, ADHD, like the DSM-5 criteria for ADHD. It, it does list out things for, you know, inattention um, or hyperactivity and impulsivity. Uh, but something interesting, and I, and I couldn't... I didn't realize this until like maybe a month ago where it doesn't speak to the em emotional components really with ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, meaning that I noticed that there are, there are things that says like, you know, often losing, losing things necessary for tasks and activities and then easily distracted and forgetful in daily activities. There isn't a component that says, um, you know, has increased anxiety around social situations or mm -hmm. um, in classroom situations, you know, and, and uh, things like that. Do you, do you know why that might be? Why they might have uh, left do. those out? I do. It's a great question because uh, <clears throat> when the DSM-5 was being uh, created, um, I knew the people who were uh, responsible for um, developing the new criteria. Yeah. Same was true for the DSM-4. When the criteria developed, the people, the committee that puts them together, they, they reach out to the community and they ask us, well, what do you think? What should we do? We send them papers, we send them articles, we say. Mm -hmm. And what, I, I had at the, at the time of DSM-5, me and some other colleagues had written papers that essentially suggested that, that symptoms of emotional Dis, uh, dysfunctional emotional self-regulation ought to be in the criteria, especially for adults, because what the research shows is that as a person with ADHD gets older, they get less hyperactive and impulsive. Uh, they continue to be inattentive and you tend to see more symptoms of emotional dysregulation. 
So the committee, all very good people, and I have no, this is not a criticism of them. They're very good people that did the right thing. Um, they decided they couldn't add, they shouldn't add symptoms of emotional dysregulation because they were worried that some clinicians would have a hard time distinguishing ADHD's emotional dysregulation from the kind of dysregulation we've seen in other disorders like oppositional defiant disorder or uh-huh. depression or anxiety. And they, they thought because of the concern of kind of muddying the distinction, um, they decided against that. Um, I would have done it, you know, I still would have argued for it because I think that that distinction can be made and we need to teach people better how to do it. Uh, but it is what it is. And uh, when I lecture to clinicians about ADHD, especially in adults, I'll, I'll say to them, if you have a case on the borderline and you're not really sure about the diagnosis, take a look at the emotional symptoms. And if they have a lot of emotional symptoms of ADHD, then even though it's not a DSM criterion, that might, in your clinical um, formulation, tip the scales in favor of an ADHD diagnosis. Right, right, yeah. And, and yeah, and that's what I, I kind of look for. And, you know, I, I've, I was doing it kind of without necessarily thinking about it in the moment, but then when I would go back and, you know, review the case and, and review their situation, um, I would look for it. Um, and it's very interesting that you, you talk about how it, that they were concerned, the committee was, was concerned about not being able to tease out those details, you know, especially with things like generalized anxiety disorder mm-hmm. and, yeah. Um, and one of the things that I found w- is helpful is using the, you know, survey questions that like in the Connors fourth edition, mm-hmm. right? Like in these other kind of, uh, t- testing that's used for ADHD. Um, my, my current favorite one is, is the Connors fourth edition, um, simply because I can use it to talk to you know the 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 child the parent as well as the teacher um because i really try and survey all of them um Mm -hmm. and then do a repeat follow-up you know after treatment in about uh six months or so um do you how do you or or what do you look for in a survey like like say the connor's you know, what would you be looking for to have included in those that's, that's important to you? Well, if once you see a rating <clears throat> scale, it, it really depends upon the goal of the rating scale. So if there are, I like to, but for your, for your listeners who don't understand what I mean by that, a rating scale is just a series of questions that a parent or a patient responds to either by the clinician asking them or by the parent filling a form out or the adult patient filling out a form. Now these rating scales, um, there's really two types. So the one we call narrow band is there's a very narrow focus on one thing like ADHD. Mm-hmm. And so many people will, will give the parent or patient an ADHD rating scale to get a, an initial sense of what, what, the, what are the main symptoms of the person. Uh, I do want to emphasize that rating scales aren't meant to diagnose the disorder. They're meant to be a guide for the clinician to ask questions and to fully understand the patient's clinical picture. And then there's broad, broader band rating scales, which cover more than ADHD. A good example would be the Child Behavior Checklist or the, uh, the BASC Behavior Assessment Scale for Children. Uh, these scales will measure multiple aspects of a child's functioning and can be used to uh, give hints, if you will, about whether the child has more than one disorder. So it, you'll ask about ADHD symptoms, depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms. Uh, and there, that can be useful for monitoring children with ADHD because we know they're at high risk for other disorders later in life. And so if they periodically have are given a broadband rating scale, it can alert the clinician to be worried about an emergence of a new disorder. Um, but there are lots of good rating scales out there for sure. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, that's why I looked for certain ones that included those other things like, you know, like you're saying, like oppositional defiant and cognitive disorder. I, I think that, um, sometimes people may think that ADHD isn't such a big deal. Like it doesn't, it's like, okay, you know, they can't pay attention that well. And then, you know, they may think that, well, I couldn't pay attention that well. What's, what's kind of the big deal mm-hmm. about my child having ADHD. And I think it's important to point out that there is a uh, progression 
that starts in childhood and can lead up to, you know, cognitive disorder and um, oppositional defiant and uh, and lead to things that are, you know, could be illegal in nature um, and very harmful to, you know, individual human beings um, as well as society sometimes. Um, Absolutely. ADHD predicts future, uh, it, it predicts bad things that will happen in the future. Not for every person with ADHD. There are some kids with what I call simplex ADHD, relatively mild, and they will only have ADHD. But even those kids, they're going to suffer from failing in school because they can't pay attention in school. Um, they're going to have problems get, perhaps getting along with friends because of their behavior annoys and irritates their friends. Uh, and that's huge in a child's life if they can't integrate into a peer group. And then if they have a more severe case of ADHD, uh, yes, they can develop these other conditions. Substance use disorders are, are, are worrisome. Kids will start drinking alcohol and take drugs at a mm -hmm. young age, um, getting involved in, you mentioned antisocial behaviors, becoming depressed. Um, and even, although it's relatively rare, later in life, there's now very good data to show that people with ADHD are at increased risk for dying early due to, mostly due to accidents and suicide. Um, so the idea that it's a mild condition society shouldn't worry about it is is really wrong because if you don't worry about it until it's it becomes very very serious it's too late you can't you know you can still you when somebody's a substance abuse well yes you can treat substance abuse but the treatments aren't very good you're much better right. at preventing it by treating it early and we do know that early treatment and this again there are studies that show this early treatment of adhd uh, with the current treatments that are available reduces subsequent risks for developing substance use disorders Reduces risk for criminality, reduces almost all of the risks, uh, all of the adverse outcomes for ADHD. Yeah, that's a very interesting um, point that if you treat with medications, because, I mean, of course, parents are worried about starting medications, um, you know, that, that in actuality, it prevents substance use disorder. Because one of their concerns is that, oh, my child's going to become addicted to, you know, Ritalin or, or something along those, those lines, like a stimulant, but in fact, it, it prevents, you know, exactly. future possibility. Exactly. And, and they, they don't, and they don't become addicted to their therapeutic drug because they, when the drugs are taken therapeutically, it doesn't have addictive potential. It, it, as you said, it's just the reverse. It protects them against substance abuse, protects, it protects yeah. them against drug abuse. Yeah. Uh, very, very interesting conversations I've had, you know, in my clinic about it. Well, you know, there's um, a lot of misinformation out there on the internet about drugs for ADHD, and you shouldn't you shouldn't give drugs to kids. And a child's brain is developing, so giving them a drug like Ritalin is not going to be good for their brain. There's no data to suggest that that's true. I mean, that's it's actually, in fact, it's just the opposite. These brains are not developing normally, and that's why they need to have medication. They need to have medication to get them back on the right on the right course. Um, mm -hmm. And by the way, when the, people have done imaging studies and they've looked at uh, they find, you know, small but um, reproducible differences between kids with and without ADHD or adults with and without ADHD. Um, what they find is that um, those brain differences are, they're not caused by the medication. They're just actually part of the disorder that is explains to some degree why some people have ADHD and some, some people don't. Uh, one, one more point about parents that are worried about side effects of medication. Um, there's... If you're faced with the decision, do I give the child medication or not? You have to balance two competing risks. One risk is the risk for side effects that you most people get. Most people think about the risk people don't think about is the risk of not medicating my child, and that risk is very high. That's the risk of your child eventually abusing substances, not developing a good peer group, doing worse in school, and and many many more. So, it's up to every parent to make that decision. I'm not dictating what one should do, but you you can't ignore the risks of not treating a, a condition. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's when I have parents in, you know, in, in the exam room and, and I realize that, oh, these are really good parents. They, they brought their child up really well and they provided them lots of love and comfort. But now the child has reached a transition point where, the parent can no longer provide that support. For instance, as they get closer to high school, mm -hmm. um, they hit a point where they need their executive functions, you know, operating optimally 
to achieve their own goals. And it's kind of then that, that this ADHD arises and causes significant problems for them. That's right. Transitions are very difficult because as I was saying before, you've got you know, the brain's ability to self-regulate on the one hand and the self-regulatory challenges of the environment. And during a transition, what happens is the, the child loses the parental regulation that's been helping them out. And then they're thrown into an environment which requires a lot of a lot more self-regulation than they're used to. And they can, I mean, literally they can fall apart and do very poorly in school. And and sometimes ADHD will emerge later on because it may have been always there, but because if they had a helicopter parent, let's say, um, we, we, my friend and I like to call it social and emotional intellectual scaffolding. The, the parents yes. and the teachers put yeah. a scaffold that holds up the child. And then when that scaffolding is gone because they go to, they go take a job or they go to college, um, the ADHD emerges full blown. And people think, oh, this ADHD is strange. It just started when they were 20 years old. Well, it was always there. It's just that the scaffolding held them together for longer. Yeah. And, and that's kind of, um, I know there were some age limits, you know, or, or in, in the diagnosis, there is like, a certain in, in age at which you have to say, hey, they had um, yes, age 12. ADHD. Yeah, yes. age 12. Yeah. Um, thank you. And it's interesting that, that that's there to me um, because sometimes in, in, in practice, it's hard to go back to that age and discover what was exactly going on with them. Um, can you speak a little bit about that kind of age requirement there? Oh, absolutely. It's one of my favorite topics. So before the DSM-5, we had DSM-4, uh, which there the age limit was seven. You had to have symptoms yeah. before the age of seven. Then uh, a number of us, including myself, I did a whole series of studies which basically showed that that age seven criterion was not valid and that later, later onsets in adolescence were clearly valid. And so mm -hmm. when the DSM-5 committee reviewed the literature, there was substantial data up to about age 12. And so they, they raised it to age 12. Now, m many of us, including myself, make the point that age 12 is still arbitrary. It's less arbitrary because it's based on, on available data. But we, anybody in the field of neuroscience knows that there's no switch in the brain that turns off at age 12 that says you can't develop ADHD. And so it, it, it is a what I call a diagnostic hack in the sense that it's put there <laughs> because People who one of the things when someone's when the committee is developing a diagnostic system, they're thinking, how is this going to be used out in the world, real world, and how can we avoid as many wrong diagnoses as possible? And right. I think the, what the committee was concerned about was that if you drop the age and onset criterion, there'd be many many cases being diagnosed in adulthood without any reference to childhood, and that would increase the number of inappropriate diagnoses of ADHD. Now, again, there's no proof that that would actually happen, but that that was the concern. So that's why this kind of hack is put into diagnostic criteria because it kind of, it makes, it sort of, you know, as you know, as a clinician, it forces you to think about their childhood, even when mm -hmm. you can't. And then when you can't document it, and, and you frequently can't, right? A 40-year-old comes in, or, and, you know, with no data from parents or anything like that. Uh, and we know, by the way, from, from, we know from prospective data that you, if you follow kids up from childhood into adulthood, when they're adults, you ask them at their childhood, they don't remember. They typically don't remember their ADHD symptoms. They're very right, bad. Right. They're very, they have very bad recollection. <clears throat> and, and you know that. So as a clinician, you're not going to deny treatment to somebody because they have a bad memory, which is part of having ADHD. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But it does create a, it, it creates a conundrum. And what my advice is always for clinicians about diagnosing ADHD without a documented childhood onset is just to be cautious. Is to be cautious because that's where you need to do a little mm -hmm. bit more work. Maybe you want, uh, you know, especially if someone has a, a later onset, you hopefully they have lots of symptoms of the disorder, lots of impairments. It's not just a mild subthreshold case. Um, you want to be sure it's not somebody that's a drug seeker who really just wants to get Adderall or Ritalin to sell to somebody else, which does happen, unfortunately. Yes, um, but yeah. caution caution is warranted in those cases. Yeah, and I I mean for me I'm uh, definitely more on the on the cautious side. Um I'm I'm lucky enough to have a clinic where I can spend an hour with my patients. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um and and talk to them and and really understand, you know, one from a physiologic standpoint that they're not 
suffering from any other, um, you know, other conditions that may mimic ADHD. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I can go through all of that with them. Um, and then also it gives me a chance to try out certain other medications that aren't stimulants, you know, and see, okay, does this, does this work for them? Mm -hmm. Um, or does it change anything for them at all? Um, because I mean, nine times out of 10, they're, they're more worried about the stimulant than, um, other medications, you know, it's just, uh, I guess it's yep. a, a little bit of a stigmata, but also, uh, realistic too, I think. <clears throat> um, whenever, whenever parents present an office with their, their child, they usually have three concerns. One, you know, how do I help my child at home? How do I help them at school? And then they will say, I've heard about these executive functions. Um, you know, what, what are those, mm -hmm. right? That's usually the, the, the three different kind of questions they have. Um, can you, can you kind of explain a little bit about the executive functioning for, for my audience? Absolutely, absolutely. So the term executive dysfunction is used by um, neuropsychologists to describe uh, functions of the brain and the brain does many things, but one of the, th one of the things the brain does is helps us think, it helps us organize the world around us. And there is these executive functions are basically uh, cognitive skills, mental skills that allow us to essentially self-regulate, that allow us to control coordinate our other cognitive abilities and our behaviors. It's, it's kind of like the master control of the brain. Um, it puts, because there's, there's a part of the brain, as you know, you have a part of the brain that controls your vision, what you're seeing. You have a part of the brain that helps you read. You have a part of the brain that is involved in your emotions. All, all these different, many parts of the brain are getting lots of information and your brain is trying to decide what to do with that information in terms of behaving. It's the executive functions that put it all together. These executive functions occur in a part of the brain called the frontal lobes at the very front of the, uh, where your forehead is basically is your, where your frontal lobes are. And it's believed that um, ADHD occurs because there's difficulty with other parts of the brain communicating with the frontal lobes and leads to a breakdown in, in executive dysfunction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and how do you how do you approach improving these areas? Well, that's a, uh, you're asking a whole question. That's a big question. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's a, it's a perfect question. Um, so in, in, in the current approach to ADHD, the first approach to treatment is a medication for ADHD, of which there are now many and patient or, and or parent discusses with the doctor, which is the most appropriate form. The goal, first goal is to get the patient um, stabilized on a medication. By stabilized, I mean um, the medication has gotten to an adequate dose, it's controlling symptoms, and if there are any side effects, they're controlled as well. And at that point, after the clinicians have, you know, the typical psychiatrist, although nowadays a lot of nurse practitioners are doing, are prescribing, um, once the prescriber gets to the point where they, they feel they have optimal symptom control for the medication, the next step is to see, well, what else is not going right in this child's life? Is, are mm -hmm. they completely 100% okay? I, and it depends on the person. There are some people who are just with the medication, things are fine. There's nothing else that they need. But it's not always the case, and it, it varies. So um, it'll frequently happen with, for example, in the case a parent will um, come in, they'll accept the medication treatment, the prescriber does a good job, the parent will come back and say, everything's wonderful. And because things have changed dramatically, the parents are very happy because these medications are, are very, very effective. And mm -hmm. then what happens, maybe like a few months later, they come back and they say, well, you know, I've kind of noticed that he or she is not really doing as well in school. Or they're having some problem with their friends. And what happens then is that they've kind of realized that the first tremendous effect they saw of the medications, while it was, it was very reassuring to them because it, it really, you know, in, in some ways was life-saving, um, it didn't do everything. And then... So the prescriber has to always be kind of looking for what are the additional problems that are emerging um, after the initial treatment. And that's when, that's when you think about um, adding on other treatments, psychological treatments, behavioral treatments that might help. So to get back to executive, executive functions, uh, this is particularly an issue for uh, older adoles adolescents and adults. 
uh, we have, when I say we meaning as a field, the field has developed a special, uh, specialized cognitive behavior therapy mm -hmm. for adolescents and adults. And for the, for the listeners, the cognitive behavior therapy is a therapy that uh, it's a very focused therapy that deals with how the patient is thinking and how the patient uses their thoughts to regulate their behaviors. And for a person with ADHD, it spends a lot, it's like teaching them how to self-regulate, teaching them life skills so that they can organize their life better and, and do better at whatever they want to do better at. It's not telling them that you have to do one thing. It's saying, you want to be the best salesperson ever? Okay, here's how you can help regulate your life. Um, because um, although the medicines are extremely effective, uh, one phrase I like, I don't know who said it first, but it's the phrase that, you know, pills don't provide skills. What pills do is that oh, that's provide, a good one. Yeah, well, they provide the ability of the brain to self-regulate, but they, they're not going to make up for all the skills a person has has missed. And so, it could be a child who's maybe they're treated at the age of seven, but they've had ADHD since four. So for half their life, they haven't really been learning the right skills. Or an adult may have not been treated for most of their life. So typically, life skills need to be taught in some setting for the older, for the adolescent, older adults. It's cognitive behavior therapy uh, for kids. It's usually family behavior therapy is the um, is the method that's used, and that's a method where the parent learns methods that they can use to help their child learn to be uh, better socialized. Yeah, and and I think um, that's a good point that there is a a social component to it because I think sometimes when they're growing up they lose it because they're not able to either function well in class. And then, you know, some of them get ridiculed by their, their peers. Um, Absolutely. Oh, that's, that's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. Yeah. And they lose that, that, I guess that, that period in their life where it's very important to have that, that social interaction. Um, you know, and, and that's very interesting. You talk about how they build that back up with them. And it's one of the things I, I suggest too, is like, Hey, can they get into sports? You know, is there a sport they like? Um, simply mm -hmm. because it contributes to that uh, social component a, a lot. Yeah, that's a great idea. And it's also sports tend to be very well structured. So it's easier for them to learn what to do because the environment there is, 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 is particularly well structured. They have a coach telling them to do this and do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, peer, you know, people tend to think of kids as being, you know, not knowing a lot. Uh, because there's, they are learning a lot about the world, but kids know a lot about what it means to be a kid. And they know what, kids know what appropriate child behavior is. And they can spot a child that's not doing the right thing very easily. And those kids can yes. ostracize. They, 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 they figure it out very quickly. In fact, one of my colleagues many years ago, he used to do studies uh, in a special summer camp for kids with problems. And mostly, many of them had ADHD. Um, mm. But some did, some did. So it was a summer camp and he, a group of kids with ADHD came to this camp and he gave them therapy as part of the camp experience. He once, he, he told me once that he asked me, he says, how long do you think it takes for the kids with that ADHD to know, to, fi to pick out who the kids are with, that have ADHD? I said, I have no idea. He said, only in t by, by lunch at the, f f the second day of camp, they figured out yes. which of the kids are, have ADHD. <clears throat> Uh, because yes. kids are very sensitive to kids that behave differently. And, and they can be, look, kids can be also be very mean to kids that are different and very difficult. And that creates all sorts of adverse outcomes in children uh, that are different. It's, it's sad, but it's, uh, it's, a real, it's a real aspect of childhood that, again, parents have to be concerned with when they're figuring out, should I treat or not treat this, the disorder? Mm -hmm. I, I have yeah. to say another thing about the decision about treating and not treating, because it, it also, the, the very fact that many people think this way, uh, it's it's another sign about how mental disorders are stigmatized in our society, because most parents don't think about this unless they have you know they come from some special religion that you know forbids treatment. Most parents, if the doc child says, uh, the doctor says, uh, your child has cancer, we need to give them these really horrible treatments that are going to cause all sorts of terrible side effects, but will save their life. Most parents will say yes. Your child has diabetes. Mm -hmm. the doctor says you need to take insulin. Parents will say yes. If it's a medical disorder, and I'm using air quotes here that you can't see, most parents are going to be like, "Well, sure, you know, to treat them." They'll they'll ask about the side effects. They'll be concerned. They'll they'll do due, due diligence. But when it comes to psychiatric, it, it, it's it, it's a different game. They're like, and partly it's because they don't really believe it's a problem deep yes. down. 
and yeah. they're very, they're resistant to it for those for that reason. Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, thing. Sometimes I I compare it to back pain, where people do not believe that another person can be suffering so much because they've never been through it themselves. Yes, and it's like a once they have it, it's like this switch. They immediately become empathetic and. They say, oh, you know, I understand what you're going through. Um, and it, I think it's very hard, especially with the psychiatric disorders, because I, I've had people ask me, you know, well, aren't they just, you know, lazy? Like, aren't they, these are just yeah, lazy people, right. right? You know, and I'm like, uh, no, if you have this disorder, you would uh, have these similar, you know, traits and, and things going on in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and to speak to the, the kids in finding out other kids with problems. Um, I used to be a, a camp counselor too. And there would be, uh, you know, you, you're right. Like your friend was exactly right. It was almost like, like clockwork, like the next day during recess or some free play, um, they would immediately start picking on those kids with problems, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and they can be pretty vicious, like, like parents, you know, some parents were not able to observe their kid interacting with another child that had a problem um and they can they can do some uh pretty good damage even as kids that's right that's right <clears throat> um so can you talk a little bit about how you created or why you created or i guess why the the world federation of adhd uh was brought together i know it's it's a it's a big problem but can you can you talk about that a little bit Sure. So, um, in, in general, professionals like myself and yourself, uh, we like to go to uh, professional meetings to learn more about the problems we deal with and to also meet other people who are working on similar problems, uh, uh, to network, as they say. And so, in the ADHD world, uh, there actually weren't very many specialty societies for a long time. Uh, the Europeans had a group uh, called the Unithiades. Uh, it was only in the past maybe 10 years now, there's an American group to which I belong called uh, American Professional Society for ADHD and Related Disorders that meets once a year. And the World Federation was, a, um, an, uh, and I wasn't part of the original group that put it together, but the, the group that put it together had the idea that it would be good to have a uh, an organization devoted to ADHD that was uh, brought together people internationally so we could share uh, what people were doing in China, in Africa, United States, Brazil, mm -hmm. etc., about ADHD, so we could we could all learn together, and that we could also deal with problems that were international problems, like we've been trying to deal with the World Health Organization, uh, uh, for example, in the last few years about an international issue uh, that we think uh, they're not doing a good job on, and we want them to do better. Um, and that's why the, that's why we felt there was a need for a world organization. Uh, they asked me about uh, I guess seven years ago now to, to uh, become the president of the organization to help move that initiative forward. Um, and I will be president until I think next year my terms my second term ends, and then we'll turn someone else, and then we'll take over and continue with that mission. And, and yeah, you you had mentioned um, that there is a problem that they're not addressing that the World Health Health Organization is not addressing, um, that, or that you think they could do a little bit better on. Can you um, speak to that a little bit? Oh, sure. So uh, the World Health Health Organization um, has a list that they um, generate. It's called the List of Essential Medicines for Children. And what this list is, it's a list that they decide are medicines that every healthcare system should have available for their patients. Mm. Um, the problem we have is that uh, there is no ADHD, there is no medication for ADHD on that list at all. Even though uh, we have now tried twice by sending them uh, lots of documentation about the efficacy of these medications and the low rates of side effects, et cetera, literally like we're talking about a 200 page document with more details than anybody really ever would want to read about wow, methylphenidate, yeah. just, just one of the drugs, methylphenidate, which has been used, by the way, for decades. It was first used in the 1960s in the United States and has now been used around the world for decades. Um, for complicated reasons, the World Health Organization still refuses to put it on the list of essential medicines. 
Mm. Uh, the reason is essentially they're being influenced by a very small group of people who, uh, again, have stigmatizing views about ADHD and the medications for ADHD. And uh, it, it's more, it becomes, because the World Health Organization is a, in some deg degrees a political organization, it's a political decision as opposed to a medical, a correct medical decision. It's a real problem because what it means is that there are some countries where that have national health plans. And if a medication is not on that list, no one in that country can get that medication at all. Oh, wow. they don't, even if they can afford to buy it, they can't, they can't, they just can't get it because it's not on the list. And so it's a huge, huge problem not to have a medication for ADHD on the list, especially when we have many that work very, very well. Yes. Yeah. That, that, um, that is, that does sound like a big problem. And I've, I think I've, I've run across that list before, um, when I took some natural, uh, disaster courses, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and where, you know, it's like this country, you know, they need these medications. Um, and it's, and like you're saying, it says, here's a list for them. Um, but that's, that's very interesting. There is a lot of, you know, political influence on certain areas of medicine that, that simply just does not need to be there. Um, Exactly. You exactly. know, nutrition, uh, you know, our, our nutrition is, is the same thing in America. It's heavily influenced. Um, and so I, I really, I really feel for you there trying to get that through. Um, well, I think, I think that kind of um, covers mostly everything I, I wanted to talk about. And I know our, 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 your time is limited and, um, I, I really, let me, let me, let me, let me say two things, two more things. Sure, sure, um, sure, sure. I, I do like, to, um, because I know that parents will listen to this, people with ADHD will listen to this. And when you learn about ADHD, you do learn about a lot of the negative aspects of the problem because it's, it is a disorder. And by definition, if it's a disorder, it's a problem. And you hear, oh, it's ADHD is associated with this. ADHD leads to this bad outcome. I, I, I always want people to, with ADHD to understand that ADHD is just one aspect of their person. It is not the defining aspect of their person. Uh, there are many, anyone with ADHD has many other aspects about them, many of which are very positive. You might have artistic talent. You might have a special skill in a certain area. You might be a very funny person. Who knows? We're all, we're all very different. And so you shouldn't let a negative view of ADHD kind of drag you down and make you think that you're somehow less of a person because of that, because everybody's got problems. Some of us have back problems. Some have diabetes. You just have ADHD. Try to, try to you know, while it's important to treat your ADHD, also learn about your strengths, focus on those strengths, and use those to make your life better. So I also mentioned that uh, I do curate a website called ADHDevidence.org, where I provide evidence-based information to people interested in ADHD. Totally free. There's no paywall. I, I don't even ask for your email address. Um, take a look. You might like it. Many people seem to to do. We've had, uh, I think we're close to getting to 50,000 visits uh, in the first year of operation or so. So with that, I think I'll bid you goodbye, Tom, unless you have any last words. That is a perfect ending. I really appreciate it. That website is fantastic. Everyone should go check it out. It is uh, really great. Um, but I thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, it's been a great talk with you. And I look forward to reading more uh, papers that you publish. Thanks very much. Good talking to you. Take care. All right. Good talking to you too. The Clear Health Podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional health care services, including the giving of medical advice and no doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of information on this podcast and materials linked from this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.